Surveillance Support 102. 202. 202. You're so right. <laughs> we did a whole special in person and everything. I was going to say, damn, you just cut out 100 episodes, man. Yeah. Anyway, Surveillance Support 202 Q&A. And the main questions that we're going to answer this week, is there some underlying inf- knowledge required to threat model that we don't discuss enough? The security of some Android stuff and then Darknet Diaries and our thoughts on some of that, as well as Facebook possibly removing YubiKeys from accounts. And we also got uh, quite a few statements this week. So we'll we'll try to address the statements. We'll go through questions first and then kind of touch on a couple statements that people made. This is our Q&A. They come from people who financially support our podcast and keep it going. We like to di- diversify income sources so we don't have all our income coming from one sponsor or even multiple sponsors. We like to have all of you get involved so that we can have it community run. We can also get ad revenue from YouTube and we also get sponsors as well. And we also have Libra Pay and things like that. You can leave a question and join our next Q&A on patreon.com slash surveillance pod. And we also now accept questions directly one off with just Monero using XMR chat. And all links to do that are down in the description. So the first question is from David Johnson, and he has three questions. So the first one is, I'm going to TLDR this. We say a lot of times it's important to threat model, but David pretty much says that a lot of threat modeling requires deep enough knowledge to understand and make good judgments and assessments of threats and risks to be able to like distinguish what's realistic and not realistic. In this context, what are the top three hardware software platforms technologies that each of you took the time to learn that have made the most difference to your privacy and security? That's a word I haven't seen. Adroitness? It means cleverness or skill. Yeah, it made the most difference to your privacy and security experience. And what are the top three that you are keenest on learning and expectation of obtaining the same benefit? I think first off, it's kind of a difficult question because there is no like, threat modeling is almost this meta knowledge of the space. And I do think it's a really valid question because it does require almost time with tools, time with privacy, time with security, time with working with people and seeing people discuss it to understand what's realistic and not realistic. And I feel like that more than just understanding end-to-end encryption, it's understanding how end-to-end encryption fits into the things that you're trying to assess are risks or not risks. So I think that kind of meta-knowledge is really hard to pinpoint ways to develop that. And I think it's a good question, and we should talk more about how we can develop that over time because it's not easy to do. For me, it was, and this is what a lot of people do, unfortunately, it's going and seeing what the limits are. I think when TechLore was, you know, maybe like five, six years ago, it was a lot more maybe geared towards an advanced audience in a lot of ways. I always tried to make it easy to understand everybody, and that's always been a goal. But I think a lot of the advice that was shared was a lot more extreme. And nowadays, it's more nuanced, and we still go into the advanced advice but it's given with a little bit more context of, hey, this is really advanced. So I think really a better question is how do we save people from having to go down that journey of seeing what the max is before they know how far to step back after learning what's realistic and not realistic? And I know I'm kind of asking a new question from your question, but it's because frankly, I don't know. I don't know what the best way to do that is. And that's what we're trying to figure out every day when we're trying to educate people about privacy and security. I don't know if Nate has a better answer here or if he has a better way to articulate the way he views it, but this is kind of what we're trying to do at TechLore at least, which is how do we like allow people to better make these judgment calls based on our experience of having to go through this whole thing? I actually kind of want to push back on this question in the sense that I hear what you're saying, David, and I, I, to an extent, I agree with you, but like at the same time, so what won me over to privacy, I actually distinctly remember where I was. It hit me that hard. I was listening to Michael Basil's show back when he still had a co-host and they were talking about if you keep your whole life in one ecosystem, like Google, I was a Google person, believe it or not. I used Gmail, Google calendar, Google search, Google Chrome. I loved Google. And they made the comment, they're like, the defender needs to get it right every single time. The attacker only needs to get it right once. And if that happens, my calendar, my emails, my search history, my web history, my YouTube, everything is now open. That was the moment they hit me. And I was like, oh my God, they're right. I should probably like decentralize a little bit. And that's what started me down the rabbit hole of like, well, while I'm switching, let me explore some different, do I want Proton? Do I want Tuda? I really do not consider myself a technological person. Like, a tech savvy person compared to a lot of you guys, like, like you're not wrong. You do, you do have to have some knowledge to understand the different threats out there, but it's really more about understanding. I think the biggest thing is the likelihood of those threats, because I think a lot of people, 
you know, like a big thing we run into is the whole, like, I have nothing to hide. Well, that's because people don't understand the likelihood of threats. They think that, you know, first of all, they think that privacy means I don't want the government to know I exist. But at the same time, I think you are right. Because, you know, an another thing I pointed out a lot of the time is people think that, again, going back to I have nothing to hide, they think that identity theft means like, oh, somebody's going to look at me online and be like, this person seems like they have a lot of money. Let me steal their bank account. And that's not what it is at all. It's, I have a social security number. Let me see how many credit cards I can open and never pay back because I don't care because it's not in my name. So I don't know. I, I think it is a mix of both. I just want to, I want to reiterate and underline something I said. I think it's two completely different knowledge sets. And I don't know if that's what David's, David's getting at, but the reason I say this is some of the smartest, most technical people I've seen in the privacy space seem the least capable of threat modeling because it is not about, it's, it's a different way of looking at things completely. It's why some of the CEOs behind some of the best tech companies out there building the best tech don't know anything about tech. It's their ability to make judgment calls, to see things from a big picture, understand risks, understand the environment, understand what's happening. So I, I think that's what I was saying about this like meta knowledge. It's this ability to analyze what's happening, understand how it impacts you. It, it, it's almost like tech smart versus street smart kind of, kind of vibes where you can memorize facts, you can be fantastic uh, with book stuff. But if you don't know how to apply it to the real world, then you kind of have this like missing piece to the puzzle and you're not going to be able to apply it properly. I think that's the point I'm trying to make here. And I don't know how to teach that. The next question is also from David. People often say that in some ways, stock Android is more secure, albeit less private, than custom Android-based mobile OSs. Supply chain malware in the form of lookalike apps is probably no less prevalent in the Play Store, if for no other reason than more people use it than like F-Droid, for example. In this context, what do you think would be the top three security concerns when using a custom OS with F-Droid and Aurora instead of Google stock Android on a Pixel? And what are the best ways to mitigate that? I haven't really heard this argument myself, to be honest, but I could certainly see that argument for certain OSs. I mean, I think the main thing is to make sure that you're getting it from official sources, make sure you're checking the checksums, because really, in my opinion, it's all about like the platform, you know, and we've said this before, like if your device is compromised, whether that's on a hardware level or an OS level, it doesn't matter how good signal is. They can theoretically, depending on what the form of compromise is, they can still see the chats. It doesn't matter how private Proton is if you have the mail app, like they can see everything. So it's really like, you have to make sure that's secure. I would say top three security concerns. I, I don't know. I would say that just making sure you're getting an official thing, make sure it's secure. Once you start using it, be careful what you put on there. Cause again, it doesn't matter how good the OS is if you're loading malicious apps and giving them permissions. That's really all I got. I don't know if I got top three. I think those are it. I think those are good. I think you know, it's it's hard to do a top three. Some three I just took notes on right now is one, delayed security updates. That is going to vary greatly by project. Some projects might go a month without getting a security update, and some I've seen beat. Almost none of them will beat. There's almost always going to be a delay from when Google pushes a security update to when the developers push a security update for a lot of these custom operating systems. Most of them are a day or two, not a big deal. But if you're somebody who's very concerned about zero days, which is a specific threat model for specific people, that is something to be aware of. I think a second thing, which is something maybe not talked about enough, is there can be a big false sense of privacy and security with these tools. I think some people might think that just because they're on a custom OS, that means that everything I do on their phone is somehow private. It's just not the case. If you install Facebook on a de-Googled phone, it still can do a lot of things, regardless of whether or not there's play services or if they're sandboxed or if they're micro G, there's still some insight there and it's not a perfect solution no matter how you cut it. So the tools you use are still super important. And I would argue in a lot of cases, the tools can be more important than the operating system, depending on what you're doing. If you're not using an end-to-end -end encrypted messenger, but you're still using a custom OS, for example, I think that's just a silly way to prioritize for a lot of people. And then the third thing is, again, this all depends on the person, but you do lose access to some features like Google's advanced protection program, or maybe something like Apple's lockdown mode, if you want like security more like automated and taken care of for you by some tech company instead, kind of different use cases for different people. So I don't think that's inherently like a concern. Just know that it's a choice that you're making between like the custom OS route versus going with something that's like a typical OS shipped by a tech company. So those are kind of the three things I'd mentioned. None of them are like reasons to avoid custom OSs, but you asked what are three concerns and the best way to, to mitigate them is use OSs that update frequently. Make sure you're using automatic updates on all of them. 
and don't have a false sense of privacy and security, still use good tools when you're using custom OSs. They're not just this magic tool that can instantly make you private and secure. And also just make sure you're making conscious decisions between different security tools available to you and make sure that you're going through adequate parties that you feel like will give you the best protection. Last question is really quick and not one I can say much about. You've referred to Darknet Diaries. What are your top three favorite episodes? I think I've listened to half an episode. Guys, I don't listen to many podcasts and I liked what I heard from it and it seems like a great podcast, but I can't answer this question. So I'll leave it in Nate's court. Okay, I've heard every episode just because I've I've mentioned before, I have a lot of free time to listen to podcasts. Usually I'm actually like a week behind right now, but I don't have specific top three, but I can say that my favorite episodes honestly are like the physical pen test episodes where he interviews people who do like, they are hired to physically break into the building and like some of them will literally like wait until nighttime and jump the fence and others will like, you know, do a lot of research and make fake badges. And it's, it's really interesting to hear the whole range of like the different tools they use and the different techniques and where they succeed and where they fail. And yeah, I think, I think those are my favorite episodes personally. Yeah, it's a good show. I like it. So um, the last few things aren't really questions, but uh, since it's such a slow week, we'll go ahead and take them. Well, this one's kind of a question. <laughs> so es Esquilax says, I have a Facebook account, and recently I discovered that they randomly removed all my YubiKeys from my account, and 2FA was no longer enabled. For now, I'm putting it down to technical error as I saw no evidence of unauthorized access, although I've obviously changed my password just in case and re-registered the keys. I've written their support, but I'm not expecting a reply. And then he says, if you want it as a question, have you ever heard of this happening before? It's a good reminder that 2FA is no protection against screw-ups by the provider. First of all, I have to say, as a big fan of this, thank you for not immediately jumping to the mindset of like, oh, Facebook's trying to weaken my security or whatever. Like, there's an amazing phrase out there, and I don't know who came up with it. And I've heard several variations, so I don't know which one's the original. But it's never attribute to malice that which can be ascribed to stupidity, incompetence, greed, etc. Like you can put pretty much any word in there, honestly. And I really feel that way. Like for me to say somebody maliciously did something, I have to rule out all those other possibilities. Like were they just tired and hadn't had their coffee? Were they, you know, not getting enough sleep? Were they stupid? Are they a major corporation where things just slip through the cracks? Like these things happen, guys. And it's amazing that some people will see like, you know, Apple had this bug. And for the record, I'm not talking about the iOS photo bug. I have opinions on that one. But like the littlest little bug, there'll be like a little bug and people are like, oh, ob obviously Apple did this as a backdoor. There's no way that they're one of the world's largest companies with thousands of employees. And those employees, by the way, are normal people just like you who are like, I do not get paid enough to put up with this garbage. That's not my job. And therefore it just slipped through the cracks. No, it has to be Tim Cook, personally told them to put that in as a backdoor and it's just completely insane. So first of all, I know that's not what you're asking, but thank you for saying like, this was probably just a mistake. But in answer to your actual question, I've never personally seen that happening before, but yeah, I, I'm with you. Like, I, I think it was probably just some kind of glitch or something. If it keeps happening, I would be a little concerned. But I mean, Facebook, it, it's been years since I used it, but I remember they seem to update their website like every month. It seems like they were, they were constantly changing the UI and stuff. So who knows? Maybe they just rolled out some kind of update that bricked a bunch of stuff. Good on you for noticing. And I think my reminder here is don't forget to check your settings periodically. See if things change. See if something went away like this. Sorry, I know that was a bit of a rant. but No, I know. It's fine. I, I don't disagree. But I think that is kind of the over overarching story with Facebook is they seem to make these continuous, really stupid mistakes. They also stored people's passwords in plain text. They've continually demonstrated that they have no care for releasing software that is bug free, that's safe, that's secure, that's private. In fact, Zuckerberg himself a couple of weeks ago said that's part of their culture. They want to roll things out quickly, unlike other companies. Where I was going with this is any other sensible provider would alert you by email if they disable 2FA in your account. And I don't know why you didn't receive that. I don't know if there was a mistake on your account. I've never heard of this before. But just know when you're using Facebook, you are committing to using a company that continually makes mistakes like this. And I don't have an issue saying that. I don't think they even do it on purpose. I just think that they're incompetent with this kind of stuff. Well, I mean, for the record, they did say, I have a Facebook account. Not good, I know, but I have my reasons, which I, I'm not going to judge you on that one. I totally get it. I'm not saying you need to delete Facebook. I'm just saying, like, when you have a, an account like Facebook, like, this stuff is going to happen at one point or another. Whether your account was stuck in that 
plain text data breach back in the day, or you were a victim to you're going to be a victim to one of Facebook's issues at one point or another. And I guess we had a couple more statements on XMR chat. Again, XMR chat is a way if you want to give us questions, but you don't want to contribute monthly on Patreon and whatnot, join us on XMR chat slash surveillance pod, I believe. Somebody said do a video on Xano, lots of buzz about it. We don't really do videos on surveillance support about that or just in general. We kind of just do the weekly news and the weekly Q&A, but, but we... If we could, we would. And then the second question is a private one, just trying to explain to us something we asked last week about we don't understand the private feature. And I think just to clarify, because my question is still unanswered, if somebody asks a question for a public Q&A privately, we need to still address the question publicly in our public response. So the whole private thing doesn't make much sense to me. So if you want your question to be answered, do not leave us a private message on the XMR chat. This is what I'm trying to say. But yeah, we really appreciate all your tips on Monero. Thank you for still like expressing to us uh, why some people might still want to leave a private chat. Thank you for a video request, but again, probably not for our specific project. And then also, of course, as always, thank you to our patrons. You guys are awesome. And you are still, to this moment, our largest source of revenue for this podcast, which is fantastic and allows us to keep expanding. We've been seeing so much growth the last few months, and our patrons are a big reason for that. And we've been having a lot of fun in the Signal group with all of you. So if you want to join Patreon, you also get access to our private Signal group. You get access to extended versions of our regular episodes if you want to hear more of our personal thoughts and analysis. And... No ads or sponsor segments in those patron uploads. So that's all I got for the week. Thank you all for tuning into the Q&A and we'll see you next time.